share some slides real quick. These just keep me on track and make sure that I remember to say everything that I want to say to you all so I don't forget anything. Um, so again, my name is Dr. Jennifer Van Reet, and I wear a couple hats on campus. Um, one of the, the great uh, things I get to do is serve as the director for our Center for Engaged Learning. And in this capacity, I get to support a lot of interesting work that uh, our PC students are doing, no matter what their major. So this is a college-wide center. And so we um, are interested in helping students who are bio majors or fine art majors or education majors or economics majors, no matter what you're interested in, um, to do something really interesting and engaging with, with what you're learning. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of the types of things that we support just to help illustrate the wide variety of opportunities there are at Providence College. But if you have, at any time, if you have uh, questions or thoughts pop into your mind, then, you know, feel free to add them uh, in the Q&A and I'd be happy to talk more about any of these things. All right, so um, I'm gonna run through a few different initiatives that we have. All right, hold on, there we go, share. Um, the first thing that we'll do that's probably a little bit more relevant to where you are in the process right now is that where we help ease the transition from high school to college and make sure that students arrive at PC and in that first semester you're already developing a foundation for thinking about how to be engaged in your learning, active in your learning, to make sure that you're setting off on the right path. And one example, right, of how we do that is we're involved in a relatively new course here at Providence College. I say relatively new because we're we're past the five year mark. So um, it's been around for a few years now, but it's called Introduction to Providence College. And this is a one credit course that helps students in their very first semester just build some foundational academic skills and build some foundational relationships to make sure, right, that you're primed for success at PC. And this taught, this course, what is really interesting about it is taught by your academic advisor, who is a faculty or staff person at Providence College. And so that means you're checking in with your academic advisor once per week in your first semester, and you're getting to know them and they're getting to know you. And that means that um, your academic advisor can really help you from day one, right? Catch small problems before they become big problems, help direct you to certain opportunities or offices on campus that may match your interests. Um, so it's been a really positive experience. I won't read these to you, right? But there's a couple of quotes up here from previous intro to PC students and just showing, right, how it really helps that first semester. Here is just a couple of examples about the project students do in Intro to PC. You know, one of the things they do is they build an e-portfolio throughout the semester where they're actually documenting their first semester of college and they're allowed to kind of do whatever they want with their e-portfolio. And so I just put up a couple of screenshots here about the various different types of things students do. And you can really see that your personality is allowed to shine through and you're really allowed to show like who you are. So it's a, it's a wonderful project and wonderful class. All right, so that was number one. Number two, uh, we help faculty and staff across campus, again, no matter what your major, do some really, some extra engaging things in the classroom if opportunities pop up. So these things are things that go maybe a little bit above and beyond. So I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, this happened recently where some of our chemistry students in organic chemistry one took a trip to a local distiller. And so what they were able to do is they were able to see how some of the practical skills, right, they're learning in organic chemistry lab get used in industry. And so here are a couple of pictures from their field trip, right? And so as you can see from these quotes, right, this field trip showed a different perspective on the distillation process. So this is really taking the skills that you're learning in the classroom and in the laboratory on campus and seeing how they're actually useful in real life. So that's one example. Another example, so we have this class, Asian art through virtual reality games. So we helped the professor who teaches this class buy some virtual reality equipment 
So you're learning art history right through this technology of virtual reality. It's been a very popular and super interesting class for students. Here's another example. Um, so we have a development of Western civilization colloquium. That's the class you take as a second semester sophomore. Uh, we have one that gets top, taught on the theme of apocalypse, and it's been very popular recently, uh, team taught by our doctors Morgan and Strader. And in this class, right, students are reading a lot of different books and novels about apocalypse. Here's one of the more popular ones, Station Eleven. You might have heard of it. It's um, uh, been a bestseller. And those students, we were actually able to get the author of this book um, to zoom in to class. And so students could actually talk to her about the book and about the themes of apocalypse. And it was just such a great experience for them, right? To actually be able to talk to the author of this book they had been studying for so long. Um, another example from another discipline is uh, we had some education students and some global studies students get to do us projects with a local uh, indigenous museum in which is located not too far from PC. And, and the personnel at this museum, right, really helped some of our future educators learn how to incorporate indigenous cultures, indigenous history into their classroom to make it more equitable and more inclusive. All right, so those are just a few examples of sort of the wonderful experiences we've been help, able to help faculty and staff bring to students. And it's, it's really exciting, right, when you get to go to a local site or uh, have a local speaker come into class, it really makes your learning come alive. All right, number three, um, this is maybe the biggest one that the Center for Engaged Learning is involved in. It's some of the stuff I'm most proud of. So we support a lot of student scholarship and creative work. So at, at PC, you're coming to learn, of course, but you're also involved in the process of creating new knowledge, which is so exciting. And again, it doesn't matter what your major is, right? Um, whether you're a music major or a sociology major or a social work major, you can be involved in the creation of something brand new. So we have a couple of different programs where students get to work on their own projects, their own research or creative projects. And then every year we host this big celebration where students from all over campus get to come and show off the work they did in the past year. Um, they do performances, they give talks, they show posters of their work. So it's this wonderful event that happens every year we even did it in the pandemic. We didn't miss a year. Um, so whether it's on the internet or Zoom or in person, um, this year we're going back to an in-person format sort of stretched over a couple of days. And so we're deep in the planning for it. Uh, I have the link down here for last year's event. Um, this is just as a little uh, challenge to you or to our, um, if you're interested in learning more, if you could just go search on the PC's website for the celebration of student scholarship, we have a number of examples from past years. And you can see all the interesting work students are doing. For example, uh, just recently, we sent five research projects to the Big East Research Symposium. Now, Providence College, right, is a proud member of the Big East Conference. And so every March, um, there's the Big East uh, Championship. And you normally think about this as a sports event, right? You normally think about basketball for good reason, right? Uh, but there's also some academic competitions that happen at the Big East Tournament. And one of them is an undergraduate research symposium. Uh, this was the, the first year, the inaugural symposium. And I have here the six uh, students who represented from Providence College. They represented five projects. And that was psychology, foreign language studies, chemistry, biology, history. So students from all over our campus, right, competed in this, this particular competition. They did a wonderful job. And we look forward to sending teams in future years. Now, some of those students that I just showed you were winter, winners of our last summer undergraduate research grant competition. So every summer, 
we fund a number of students to do research over the summer. This is essentially their full-time job. So they're paid to do research for up to 10 weeks of their summer. So we give them a stipend and some money for supplies. Some students work on campus, some students work off campus. Now this is not, uh, I don't have an image of absolutely every single winner. So this is just a representative sample of our winners. And just a couple examples of the projects they did. So here's a history project. Um, so this student, worked on deciphering the shorthand of, of Michael Wigglesworth, right, which who was a, a figure in early New England. Um, and so she has become an expert in deciphering like this, this sort of shorthand. And she's actually like one of the only people in the world who can do it. Um, it's really amazing the work that she's done. Um, something totally different, right? So we had a student uh, do a media studies project, right? And he was analyzing depictions of nuclear energy in pop media. So for example, The Simpsons and Godzilla. And so he spent a summer, you know, watching movies and playing video games, but um, that was part of his research, right? So he wrote this wonderful paper um, looking, at, looking at how those depictions, right, reflect something about our popular culture. All right, uh, now you might say like, oh my gosh, how do I ever get to a place where I can do something like that? Well, you know, we have, we have programs for first and second year students, right, too, to sort of scaffold you and help you build the skills to get to a place where you might be able to do your own project. Uh, one of those examples is we have a research work study program where we connect first and second year students who uh, need an on-campus job with faculty who are looking for research assistance. And by working for a few hours a week for a faculty member as a research assistant, right? Not only are you learning research skills, which is great, but you are forming a relationship with other faculty members as well, which is really helpful. All right, that's a lot. I know I only have one more, I promise. So our fourth initiative, um, and this is sort of at the sort of tail end of your time here at PC. We also help students apply for nationally competitive fellowships and scholarships after graduation, so postgraduate fellowships. And so let me give you a couple examples of that as well. A lot of our students who are looking for a postgraduate fellowship apply to the Fulbright program. Um, the Fulbright program is a department out of the US Department of State and students go abroad after graduation and serve as sort of a cultural ambassador in a large variety of countries across the world. Uh, they do a large variety of things. So some students work as teachers, um, some students work as researchers, some students actually go to graduate school as part of a, a Fulbright scholarship. Um, we have been very successful in recent years in getting uh, the students who apply for, our, for these Fulbright fellowships for them actually winning, they're highly competitive. So as you can see that we've been named by the Fulbright program as a top producer a couple years in a row. We haven't heard the results of this year yet. Those, those results are starting to trickle out right now. Um, but I can tell you for this year, we have a record, record number of semifinalists. So we are very hopeful that we will have a number of winners again this year. Here are a couple of examples of the types of countries our students have gone to in recent years, you can see all around the world. In addition, um, we help students apply for a fellowship called Humanity in Action. In the past two years, we have had a winner from Providence College. In the middle there, that's our most recent winner, Alicia Terrero, who is wonderful. And lastly, um, the Goldwater Scholarship, which is a very competitive uh, scholarship for mathematics, natural sciences, and engineering. We have had two recent winners, which um, is very, very exciting coming out of our, our really top-notch STEM programs. All right, that's where I'll end. I know I just uh, gave you a ton of information. If you wanna follow up with me later at any time or anybody watching this recording, you have questions, there's my email address. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out. All right, let me pause.
Let me make sure there are no questions. Um, if you think of something later, don't feel free. Don't, don't hesitate to ask. Um, but I will pause for a second and I'm gonna turn it over to our Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, uh, Dean Sheila Admas Leota, and she can tell you more about our new chapter of Phi Beta Kappa. Oh, let me stop sharing. Oh, no. Oh, no, you're going to share mine, right? This. Thank That's right. you so much. Oh, sorry. I appreciate that. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll just echo what uh, Dr. Van Riet just said and remind you if questions occur to you as you're going along, please don't hesitate to even just pop them in the Q&A uh, feature and we can answer some at the end as well, because I know sometimes it, you feel a little, you know, funny asking a question in the middle, but don't hesitate. We're happy to answer anything that you would like. So, yes, as Dr. Van Meet said, I am here to speak to you tonight about our new chapter of Phi Beta Kappa. And to explain what that's about very briefly, I am the Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at Providence College. I'm actually a chemist by training, so I was quite fascinated by some of the examples like the organic chem lab uh, going off to the brewery, the distillery. I thought that was really, really interesting um, that Dr. Van Bee just presented you. But what it means that I'm the Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, it, it means that I, I oversee the academic departments in the natural sciences and the social sciences and the fine arts and the humanities. So quite a few. You might say, well, what's not there? School of Business is separate and School of Professional Studies, which includes education, social work and health policy management. So if it's not a business discipline or one of those disciplines, it's in the School of Arts and Sciences. And we're really, really proud that everyone at Providence College, no matter what your major is, studies quite a bit in the School of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Van Reed mentioned our uh, development of Western Civ Colloquium class, for example, that all of our students take on different topics, but everyone takes one. So we think that's a really important part of, our, of your education if you are a Providence College student. And we're really, really thrilled that we now have the recognition of a Phi Beta Kappa chapter at Providence College, because what that means is that an external group, Phi Beta Kappa, which I'll tell you more about in a second, has deemed us as excellent uh, providers and that we have an excellent commitment to education in the arts and sciences fields. So um, if I may have my next slide, thank you. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what is Phi Beta Kappa in case you've never heard of it. Back um, in the mid 20th century, sort of everyone sort of knew a lot more about Phi Beta Kappa, but because as higher education has changed and evolved, there are a lot more honor societies. But what Phi Beta Kappa essentially is, is an honor society. So it's an opportunity for students to be recognized. It is the nation's most prestigious academic honor society. It was founded in 1776. So, you know, a long time ago, on, at least in the United States standards, uh, it was founded um, in December of 76, I believe at the College of William and Mary. And what this honor society recognizes, because we all know there's honor societies for all kinds of things. Uh, this one recognizes achievements in the liberal arts, which is a synonymous term for arts and sciences liberal in the sense, not of you know the opposite of conservative, but liberal in the sense of free. Liberal education actually goes way back to preparing um, Greek citizens to be, to be informed citizens. So if you study in the liberal arts or the arts and sciences, you know, you're learning broadly and yet to prepare yourself for the next step. Uh, and I would be happy to answer any questions about that, but I wanna stay now focused on Phi Beta Kappa. So this is a very prestigious honor society for students to be involved in, and it therefore is um, not that easy to get a chapter at your institution. Fewer, as I have here on, on my slide, fewer than 10% of United States colleges and universities are granted a chapter. There's a long and arduous application process to be granted a chapter. It literally takes about three years to go through the process. And we applied in the fall of 2018, and we were delighted that in the summer of 2021, after multiple reports and people coming to our campus and interviewing faculty and students and staff, everybody you know, from our president on down to everybody else on campus, uh, we were awarded a chapter. And our chapter will be officially brought to life uh, in just a few weeks. We're very excited, April 26th, 2022. And that will be a big ceremony first for the Phi Beta Kappa National Leadership to come on board and give us our chapter. So there'll be lots of ceremony, um, but also for our first students to be inducted into Phi Beta Kappa. And just in a moment, I'm going to tell you what 
it would mean to be inducted in Phi Beta Kappa. I've just put the, um, the link here. I mean, it's easy enough if you're interested. You can, you can Google it, obviously. And you can look up Phi Beta Kappa and you can see they have a list of every institution that has a chapter. And you'll see some pretty prestigious names. You know, we're very, very proud to be on that list after a long time of not being on that list. So, so it's an exciting development. And again, a recognition of the academic excellence across the board at Providence College. On the next slide, if I may have that, I'll tell you a little bit now, if you're like, okay, I'm a student, I would like to be in Phi Beta Kappa. How does that happen? Well, it turns out that you don't apply. Like many honor societies, you're elected or you're chosen. So how Phi Beta Kappa works is um, you be elected by the faculty and staff members. In fact, Amy Simbor introduced uh, this session just a few minutes ago from our admission office is one of the very active members of our PC chapter to be. In fact, she's the, she's the secretary which basically means she's in charge of making sure all the students who are invited know that they are invited among many other very important functions, but that's a very big one. Um, so you would be elected um, and we can elect no more than 10% of a graduating class. And it's not the graduating class of Providence College as a whole, but of the students majoring in um, the fields of the arts and sciences. So that's about half of the graduating class overall would qualify. So about half of our students graduate in arts and sciences. Elections take place for seniors and a very small number of juniors. The criteria are a little bit steeper for juniors uh, deliberately to make it a little bit bigger of a hurdle. So there are a bunch of criteria that Phi Beta Kappa set out and then there are some that we put on at PC, but here's kind of the boiling it down. These are the things you'd probably be most, um, that'd be most relevant for you to know. Students must be majoring in an arts and sciences discipline. That can be a double major. So for example, if you're majoring in finance and Spanish as a double major, because Spanish is in the School of Arts and Sciences, you would be eligible. You need to have at least 90 credits in arts and sciences courses. Now, let me explain. This is not uncommon, but it's a little different from how most high schools work. Um, different courses are assigned different numbers of credits. You may know that. At Providence College, the, the minimum number of credits you need to graduate is 120. So you would achieve 30 credits a year on average. It may not work out exactly that way. Many of our students do graduate with more, but that's the minimum. And so Phi Beta Kappa stipulates you have to have at least three quarters of your credits in the arts and sciences. So that's at least 90 credits. Uh, students must have proficiency in college level math, which basically means in our case that you've taken your quantitative, reason, uh, re quantitative reasoning excuse me, requirement by the time you'd be elected to Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, and you also need to have proficiency in a foreign language through the intermediate level. Now, an interesting thing about a school like Providence College who are so dedicated to the arts and sciences is we do not actually require our students to take a foreign language. Uh, we strongly encourage it and many students do, but it's not formally a requirement. So um, in order to qualify for Phi Beta Kappa though, you would need to have achieved that proficiency through the intermediate level, which if you started at you know, Spanish 101 or French 101 would mean four semesters. If you test in on our placement test, which we ask all of our incoming uh, first year students to take, and you, you place higher, then you just have to get to that fourth semester level. Some students place beyond that level, in which case you would meet the requirement. But we also really hope that students will take foreign language at Providence College, um, and maybe a language you didn't have the opportunity to take in high school, like Arabic or Mandarin Chinese, although some of you may have obviously taken those too. A lot of high schools don't have that. So you would need that requirement um, and you would need to be of good moral character. Notice what I don't have on here is a certain GPA and that's on purpose. Phi Beta Kappa does not stipulate a particular GPA. We have identified one um, that may change over the years a little bit, uh, but it's, you know, it's a high GPA on a four point scale. It's well over, you know, well over a 3.5. Um, but I, I'm not sharing that right now because that's really not the most important thing. The most important thing is that you have this broad education where you've touched on a lot of different disciplines and you've excelled. Okay, so last slide for me, please, um, is, okay, well, aside from it, you know, getting recognition, which is a lovely thing about being elected to an honor society, why is it important to you as a potential member of Phi Beta Kappa? Well, besides that recognition, uh, Phi Beta Kappa provides a few tangible things. And if you go on the website, you can find even more than these, but I thought I'd just pull out a few. Uh, one is for recent graduates, they have internship opportunities at their organization at Phi Beta Kappa. Um, and they are in most cases paid, not necessarily paid you know, at a very, very high rate, 
but they are opportunities to get some great professional experience as well as, as receiving a salary uh, for recent graduates. Uh, they also have some networking opportunities. So there are alumni associations, which are really more about um, continued academic engagement. So they provide you know, book groups or lectures or things like that. So you know, if you really enjoy your education and you're not quite ready to put it down, but you don't necessarily want to go on to more formal education, or even if you do, um, you, can, you can stay academically engaged and you could not do it for a while and then do it once you're 40, if you want to. You know, you're always a member of Phi Beta Kappa uh, for the rest of your life if you accept an invitation to join. Uh, and also there are more um, employment focused networking events. They have events they call key connections. And that's an opportunity for to mention. If you notice in the lower right corner of the slide, there is a little square thing. That is a Phi Beta Kappa key. It's it's kind of the emblem and the insignia. And if you if you are elected to Phi Beta Kappa, you get one of these little keys that has um, the Phi Beta Kappa symbol on the front and it has your kind of information on the back. So it's something, you know, you can, I, some people wear it on a, a business attire. I wear it on my academic robe when I wear it, um, but that's important to know. It's also important to know that Providence College has committed to providing those keys for students as well as, you know, paying the, um, the membership fees so that being a member of Phi Beta Kappa is not a financial burden for anybody. And uh, to be initiated, again, you just need to be initiated once and then you're a member for life. So again, we are very excited to have Phi Beta Kappa at Providence College because not just because it provides a great opportunity for students, which it does, but also as a symbol of how we have, you know, met some standards for being, it's another way we can demonstrate our, our standards of ac academic excellence. Um, as, as Jennifer Van Riet said, as Dr. Van Riet said just a few minutes ago, you know, we're really excited when our athletic teams get recognition as well, and, and we support that and we cheer them on. And this is a way for us, you know, to cheer on the academic side of the house, in addition to some of the other opportunities through the Center for Engaged Learning. So with that, I will close my formal remarks. I think we can probably stop sharing the screen, and we would be happy to take any questions that you might have for either of us, Dr. Vimby or myself, or even, I'm sure that Amy would be happy to chime in if there's something you ask about that neither of us are quite prepared to answer, maybe of a more general nature. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for being here today, or if you're watching this on a, you know, a subsequent recording, thank you for your interest in PC. We're really excited about the opportunities we can provide for you. We hope to see some of you, you know, maybe many of you on campus this, this fall, if not for events sooner than that. Thank you. That's great. Thank you both for, for spending time with us and for, you know, outlining all of this uh, for the families. Um, one question that uh, we have actually is a question about um, any kind of minimum GPA or requirements that need to be in place for a student, um, Dr. Van Reed, before they get involved with the center. You know, is that something, for example, only involved with for honor students? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you for that question. Uh, no, we have no minimum GPA requirements for any of our programs. Um, that's including our research work study programs, our research grant programs, and those are some, we have academic year programs and summer programs. Um, we really believe that opportunities should be open to everybody. And actually, um, you know, one of the things that, that we have found is that the for example, the best research assistants, if you're working for a faculty member or you're doing your own project, um, the best researchers are not necessarily the folks with the highest GPAs. Um, you know, there's a sort of a different set of skills sometimes that you need to be a really great researcher. And so the skills we look for are not, you know, what grades you've got, but the skills we look for are um, what's your persistence? Um, what's your initiative? What are your you know, problem solving skills? So sometimes you hear some people call these as quote unquote like soft skills. Um, I don't really think they're quite soft, but, but some of these other skills really are better predictors of, of your research prowess. And so we look for other indications like that. And really just if you're excited and interested about doing a project, hey, that's great. That's the number one thing we look for. Um, I think the one exception to that is, you know, the last thing I talked about was our postgraduate fellowships. For those, they're not necessarily GPA requirements, 
Um, but those are competitive applications, right, that go off to other entities um, and reviewed by other entities, for example, the Fulbright program or Humanities in Action. And for those applications, right, we do counsel students that, you know, you're probably more likely to be successful if you have a higher GPA. Um, that being said, right, there's no, there's no cutoff and there's no minimums. Great, thank you. What else? What are other people thinking about? Having worked at a couple of different colleges before coming to PC, I know I'm really impressed with the fact that because our focus is the undergraduate education at PC, students can get involved right away with research and that close relationship with faculty, um, you know, from day one. So that you know, it's not the kind of thing where I know sometimes at larger institutions, right, the students have to wait to get involved with research or they're taught by graduate students. So they don't have those connections. So I know when it comes to students thinking about research or um, applying for these, these programs, um, I'm sure that you see that the faculty engagement at an early age, if you will, <laughs> you know, early in the college career is something that has really encouraged the students as well. Oh, that is absolutely true. Um, that is one thing that uh, I um, hear about all the time from not only alums, but, from other graduate programs, right? Where our students are now either employed or in school. Um, so the part of the feedback we get is that, oh, wow, you know, a PC student already knows how to do this. Whereas uh, at another institution, right? Only graduate students get to do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, at PC, because, you know, I'm a scientist, right? So I'll speak from my experience. Um, you know, in my lab, my undergraduates are doing work that graduate students would do at other places. Um, but I don't have graduate students, right? So, so the undergrads are trained to do more advanced things and sort of take on more responsibilities. And so they're, in some ways, right, you really graduate um, having a different skill set or a higher level of skill at, at places because it's just sort of out of necessity there, there are no graduate students, so the undergraduates get to do everything, um, which is wonderful. One other question might be how study abroad may prohibit students from getting involved with these things or even being considered for a Phi Beta Kappa or a um, Fulbright opportunity. Are those prohibitive or are they encouraged? Do either of you wanna speak about that a little bit? Well, I'll just say something quickly, which is we really encourage study abroad for anyone who wants to do it. There are lots of different ways to do it, right? Because you can go for a whole semester or even a year, but you can also take a course that goes for a week. You can do a summer opportunity. You can do so many things. So, so first of all, if you want to, for example, do a summer of research and you're wondering how that, maybe you can't quite schedule it. There's, there's always a way if you want to go. But as far as whether it holds you up, absolutely not. Um, we we are very much about finding a way to, to make it work for students. You know, even in some, I'm also a science person, as I mentioned, I'm a chemist. And, and when I was doing a lot more teaching and had my own research students, I remember talking to students, you know, and they say, well, I'm a double major and I'm doing this, but I still want to study abroad. Okay, all right, we're gonna, we will find a way. Sometimes we even moved courses around and offered them a different semester so that the student could not miss a key course required in the major. Um, our major is relatively small, so we, we would do it that way. Others, you know, departments, probably that's not necessary. But, but we're really, um, and, and in many cases, and I, I would imagine um, for certain fellowships and things, the study abroad experience probably actually put you at an advantage in some ways, or at least is looked at very positively. Because you, it's not just what you see, but it's how you grow when you are abroad. You are as independent as you've ever been. Uh, you are as, you know, far from your, your previous support systems in, in the best way, because you, you, everybody I've ever known who studied abroad, including my own two children, by the way, came back just having, having grown and in confidence and in skills and in their ability to sort of find their way, not just literally, but to make decisions for themselves. So it's absolutely not a disadvantage. I would say it's an advantage. And I don't know, Dr. Van Reed, if you have anything you would like to add about that. Yeah, it's definitely an advantage. Um, 
uh, some for some fellowship programs more than others, but you know, we definitely recommend that students who are interested in a type of Fulbright type experience um, study abroad if they can. It's not a requirement, of course, um, but it does show the Fulbright committees in the various countries, right, that you are um, familiar with what it means to live abroad and study abroad. And um, so that, that does provide a bit of a leg up um, in that process. Again, it's not a requirement, right? There are other ways to demonstrate that's that sort of familiarity. Um, we also, for the same reason, really encourage students to take foreign language, um, even though, again, it's not required at Providence College, but that is looked very favorably by, by fellowship committees, especially the Fulbright Committee. Um, even if it's not the language of the country you're applying to go to, right? So even if you don't have fluency in that particular language, they do like to see that you have some sort of uh, language experience other than your native language. Um, and, and so that's why, you know, it's so wonderful that we have things like Arabic and some, some other languages here at Providence College so students can really expand their horizons and get a lot of familiarity with some um, very different languages, some languages they might never have thought about before taking a class in. Um, so yeah, it's, and then the last thing I'll say is that, so some students who maybe don't study abroad, um, but have an idea for how to do a project abroad, um, we have had examples in the past of students doing research projects that involved um, international travel to collect data. So we have funded a few of these. Um, obviously, they're not quite as common, but we had one summer where a student, um, she was a film student, and she was doing a research project that involved the Cannes Film Festival. So she took part of her summer and she actually traveled to the festival to collect some data. Um, we've had other students who are working on projects in Puerto Rico um, and, and some other places, right, that are a little bit farther from, from Providence. So there are ways, right, to be creative and to get international experiences beyond just maybe your traditional semester abroad. Great. Well, thank you both. I think that was really helpful. And I know that's something students wonder about often too, is um, kind of how, how do all these pieces fit together in my four years at PC? Um, we don't have any other questions in the chat right now. So I will um, thank you both for your time and thank our audience members for being with us. We hope this was helpful. Um, I know I speak for all three of us when we say um, we wish you the best for the rest of your senior year. And if you have more questions or you want to follow up, don't hesitate to ask any of us. Um, there are some more opportunities to visit campus this spring for admitted students. So feel free to log into uh, the website and check those out or just come by for a tour um, at any time as well. We do have all of those listed up on there. The campus is back open fully from COVID and <laughs> we're excited to have everybody around. So thank you all. Uh, we will wish you a good night and we'll see you soon. Take care. Night.